This time on the Highland Woodworker. Well, here's one that's exceptional. It's Black Smith made and it's from the 1700s. An exclusive look inside one of the most impressive tool collections we've ever seen. Plus, Fine Woodworking Magazine's John Tetro shows us how he makes his miter dovetails come together. Then spend a moment with master woodworker Mike Pekovich. Asked my wife, hey, you want to move to Connecticut? She said, um, I guess so, why? How that bold move landed his work on so many issues of one of the most respected woodworking magazines in the world. These stories and more, this time on the Highland Woodworker. Hello, I'm Charles Brock and I'm a Highland Woodworker. I just love coming to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia. It's where I get all my fine woodworking tools and a great woodworking education. Hello, Ed Sin. Chuck, good to see you again. Nice to see you. Uh, Ed, I spend a lot of time honing and there's so many different blades and it's hard to keep them sharp. Is there something new in hand honing? Lee Nielsen has a beautiful honing guide. It's exquisitely made and it's going to make your life a lot easier keeping your edge tools sharp. I'd be happy to show it to you. I can't wait to see it, but first. We're in Columbia, Tennessee, the home of James Curry, and I've heard that Mr. Curry has a great collection of almost everything, especially woodworking tools. Let's go see. So I've been collecting these about 40 years. Got a 12 or 12 bay that's nothing but household stuff and kitchen stuff. Then I got a blacksmith and horseshoeing band. Then I come to the back, I've got a cobbler's band. Then I got a farm band. And I treasure it because of the history that they used on the farm. Then outside, I've got a mule drawn plow collection. I was raised on a, in, in LA, Lower Alabama, picking cotton. And I got one of the sacks hanging up right there that I picked cotton with. Yeah, I've, uh, I've accumulated a little of everything, I guess, but I've got a pretty good bottle collection. I've got a little over 1,200 bottles, and I've got a little over 2,500 cans displayed. Uh, a lot of beer cans. Beer cans, cold drink cans. Now, who emptied out the beer cans? You know, I don't really know. Uh, I found out that was numbing medicine, and I didn't need to be taking it. <laughs> I got the first Dr. Pepper can they come out with in 1960. I did carpentry work. We built houses, done remodeling, and I had an old carpenter tell me the key to being a good carpenter was take home 10 nails every night. Well, he's talking about them nails. Well, Mr. Curry, where are your woodworking tools? Well, I'd like to show you my uh, wrench collection first. Well, and, uh, Oh, this is an amazing, these are all wrenches? Yes, sir. And they're all one of a kind? Yes, sir. Now, these lower ones are for the mule drawn plows. And so uh, the, the, the multi wrench has been around for a long time. That keeps a farmer from having a total pocket full of wrenches. He can take one wrench and do it all. Here's one here that I treasure. It's, it's from 1800s. Wow, and so this kind of wedges? That's, that's a wedge wrench. And, and so the harder you pull against it. The tighter it gets. Ha! <laughs> that is just outstanding. Well, here's one that's exceptional. It's blacksmith made and it's from the 1700s. And it's made according to my, what I can find out for wooden nuts. Wooden nuts. Uh, and you were saying that uh, Leonardo da Vinci designed this wrench. Right, you see the layers of metal where he beat it together. This is one of the biggest hold downs I've ever, ever seen. Uh, I guess you would use it for really good sized lumber at, at your, your workbench. But look at all the tools up here. You've got augers of every type, uh, auger drills. Drill about any size hole. Now, what is this set right here? That's a set of countersinking tools. Wow. Used with a brace. And you've got a great brace collection. And then you got a huge collection of draw knives over there. Some that have handles that look like they 
they swing inside. They fold up. That's, that's to keep them dull in your blade or cutting yourself with it. This is why I came. This is a tremendous collection of wooden hand planes, and no two are alike, are they? No, sir. Th this is just great. You've got some rounds, and you've got some hollows, it looks like. And these were all handmade by artisans to use for themselves, yes. pretty much. Yes, sir. Yeah. Now, here's one that's pretty good. Now, that's a beauty. It's got knickers. Right. Uh huh. And a skewed blade. And this is the sole here, right? right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, just just beautiful. Well, it's evident that Stanley and the Bailey design her everywhere. It stands out as soon as you walk around the corner. It's just. You can let it down flat or either roll it up a little tighter to, and I'd say you could even make bowls of that. So this is a number 113 compass plane. Made by Stanley. Yeah. From 1877. That is a beaut. And you can tell it was used and prized. This in here has got the tonger and the groover. Uh-huh. A number 43, it looks like, by Stanley. I call that a router. It is. It is. It's just a beautiful router plane. Oh, this is a seven and a half. Well, this is a great one. A Stanley 45. Yeah, and this is the bit that goes with it. All right. And I've got another box of them right here. In the original boxes. So that's original that's great. Box. Really is. I mean, you could uh, take this to a job site and pretty much do anything you needed to do with molding. And, Either, and, any kind of molding you make. That's a chrome plated rabbit plane, hand rabbit plane. And you, uh, and then, a record number 2506, and you use it, I guess, to cut the, the inside shoulders. Right. Well, that's nice. You could go right or left. Yep, you can trim your wonder sashes with them if you need to. So that's a Stanley level made to lay rail on the railroad. Now, what's the purpose in this? Uh, over there, there's a bunch of little steps. How did they use such? Well, when you go in a curve, it's got to have so much elevation, and it's got to be level. And that's the reason of the step downs is to to work with the distance between the rails. Okay, so that way you could get you could get it just the right pitch. Right, get the right pitch on the rails. So it wouldn't throw the train off. The, right. Mm -hmm. Well, that is something that's just unbelievable. Uh, it's amazing how our forefathers planned this stuff back then. They were really smart. They know how to use their tools. And I tell you, Mr. Curry, you're very smart too. This has just Thank been you. a wonderful time looking at our past uh, as a woodworker and, and as a lover of tools. What, what a day and a time. If you'll look around your, your community, you're liable to find other collectors like Mr. Curry and uh, be able to see great history in tools. Chuck, this is the Lee Nielsen honing guy that I was telling you about. It's a beautiful piece of machinery. It's stainless steel and brass. It's not going to rest on you. Feel the heft of that. Well, that's wonderful. And I see it has some dovetail jaws. Yep, that's going to clamp most plain irons and chisels. And there are optional jaws that you can install to handle some of the other, oh, let me see, the, like a skew chisel at an angle. and. Lee Nielsen has jaws that are specific to some of the tools that they make. Well, this is tremendous. I can't wait to get it back to the shop and try it out. Coming up! It might look a little more complicated, but it's actually quite simple. Fine Woodworking's John Tetro demystifies the making of miter dovetails. Plus, we'll step inside the mine, home, and workshop of master woodworker Mike Pekovich. Stay tuned. You're watching the Highland Woodworker. 
I'm just an average down-to-earth woodworker. On a scale of 1 to 10, I'm probably about a 5. But one place I score a perfect 10 is right here. And I plan on keeping all 10. That's why I have a saw stop table saw. And there's more. Plenty of power, superior dust collection, and absolute accuracy. These features have made it the best selling cabinet saw in America. Let Highland Woodworking help you put a saw stop in your shop. For 35 years, Lee has manufactured the world's best joinery jigs. From our award-winning dovetail jigs and mortise and tenon jigs, to newer innovations like router table jigs. Easily add strong, beautiful joinery to your woodworking pieces, like half-blind dovetails, box joints, mortise and tenon joints, and through dovetails. Lee, simply the easiest and most versatile router joinery jigs. Are your tools Tormac sharp? Tormac, consistent, reliable, and razor sharp. Tormac, sharpening innovation. Workers count on American-made forest saw blades for smooth, quiet cuts every time, without splintering, scratching, or tear-outs. The famous Woodworker II is the all-purpose combination blade. But for special cuts, Woodworker IIs are available for cutting dovetails, for flat bottom joinery. A 30-tooth blade is perfect for ripping, a 48-tooth blade for superior cross cuts, and a finger joint blade set. There is a perfect forest Woodworker II for every table saw cut. Highland Woodworking has been a leader in woodworking education for more than 30 years. They offer all kinds of woodworking classes year round, ranging from how to hand cut dovetails and mortises to how to sharpen a plane or a chisel, how to build a cabinet, a chair, or a bookcase, or how to turn a wooden bowl. There are classes on wood finishing, French polishing, and even antique furniture restoration. For a list of upcoming classes that may interest you, just look in their catalog or go to highlandwoodworking.com. John Tetro, I love your miter dovetails. Why would somebody go to all the trouble of cutting a miter dovetail? Um, well, it's actually not that much more trouble than a standard dovetail. Um, it might look a little more complicated, but it's actually quite simple. And there's kind of two reasons that you might want to use it. One would be uh, for aesthetic reasons, just if you want a cleaner look around the top of a box or a cabinet. Um, but where I really like to use it is lining it up with where you would have a continuous groove, say you're holding a, a bottom in a box like this one. And it's just handy because you can just run a continuous groove like with a dado set and then lay out and cut a miter dovetail right where that groove is and it'll hide it when you close it up. So I, I took these props to the point where it would differ slightly because you're cutting a miter dovetail. So you'd lay out your normal set of tails and then you would transfer those to the pin board. And then at this point, I didn't take out this material yet where we're gonna lay out our two miter dovetails and I can show you how we'll do that. All right, well, that sounds exciting. So the first thing we would do is, is put the, uh, the pin board in the vise flipped around so the inside is facing. And this is where we're gonna cut our 45 degree 
miters. And we'll just stop just short of that outside edge. About like that. And then I'll go down to this end one. And we'll do the same thing. Okay, and then we'll flip this around, and then I already marked a line here at 45 from our scribed line to the outside corner. And then we'll just go from this scribed line right to our outside edge and clean that up. And this pine cuts nicely. If you're doing this with a hardwood, um, it's even more important to have some sharp chisels. pretty close and then we'll still leave it a little bit proud. Okay, and on to our pin board. You might have to switch to a smaller chisel to get in close to that pin. Or just angle it a little bit. And then here, you could set up um, like a ramped guide block, cut at 45. As a and reference. As a reference, exactly. That'll help you be dead on um, when you're going from this scribed line to the outside edge. But since, since we have that scribed line, and it should be exactly 45 if we just go from there to that outside edge. And just get most of it out with a by eye. We'll tap these together and see how they fit. So a little more fine tuning and some glue, and that'll be around for a while. John, I can't wait to get back to my shop and try this. What a great lesson. It's a lot of fun. Thank you. Coming up, it's a decoration you might have seen on Japanese furniture. It should be able to fit right in there. Master woodworker Mike Pekovich shows us how it's done, and it's a lot of fun. You're watching The Highland Woodworker. <laughs> Woodpeckers, makers of fine woodworking tools like router tables, precision router lifts and fences, plus measuring and layout tools including squares, rules, triangles and more. We offer unique clamps like box clamps, the knuckle clamp and XMAT system. Our one-time tool program offers woodworkers innovative new tools. Woodpeckers precision tools are made and tested using state-of-the-art equipment. Woodworking tools from Woodpeckers, tools you can trust 
for generations to come. Introducing the ultimate flush trim rounder bit by Whiteside. Get CNC quality cuts from your patterns every time. Whiteside, industrial grade and American made. Highland Woodworking stocks a wide selection of Rikon power tools known for their innovative design and rugged durability. Highland has sold thousands of Rikon's industry-leading bandsaws with sizes to fit every woodworking need, from the compact affordable 10-inch model to competitively priced 14 and 18-inch models. Shop us also for Rikon's reliable planers, lathes, and professional low-speed grinder, all with an exceptional five-year warranty. Rikon. Power tools. If you can't make it to Highland Woodworking in Atlanta, Georgia, you can shop online at highlandwoodworking.com. They're great at getting what you want to your shop quick. Moment with a Master is brought to you by Woodpeckers. Many have been inspired by Mike Pekovich's teaching and work through Fine Woodworking Magazine. He recently invited us to Connecticut so he could tell us his story in A Moment with a Master. Just beyond the colorful canoes and the cackling chickens sits Mike Pekovich's backyard workshop. This is where Fine Woodworking's art director builds his beautiful furniture, from dressers to jewelry cases to tea boxes. Mike does it all. Inside, you'll find precision hand and power tools much like the ones that inspired him to create when he was a child. Well, I think for a, a lot of woodworkers, we probably all like to do things with our hands. And for me, going out in my dad's garage and goofing around was the way that um, was a fun place for me to be. Did I he have know tools? He kind of did. Um, woodworking sort of skipped a generation in our family. So he had some tools. Uh, his dad, uh, my grandpa Mike, he immigrated to this country, um, raised uh, six kids on his own. He ran a little car garage in Billings, Montana um, with an eighth grade education. He started out by building a, a one room house and every year he added another room onto the house until how many rooms it looked like this um, this little warren of little rooms by the time it was done. Um, but definitely he's my sort of patron saint of woodworking or working with my hands. So, And one of the probably the most influential things I ever made when I was 12 years old, um, I made a soapbox derby car, you know, the kind that you get in and, and race down the hill and everything. But boy, the skill sets there for a 12 year old kid just to be shaping wood, to be tapping metal for threads, to be um, using Bondo and fiberglass and rivets and all kinds of hand tools. That was just, um, it didn't go that fast. I don't think uh, I ever had a, a body suited to be making a car that was aerodynamic enough to be <laughs> going fast, but the process of building the car was fantastic. And I think that probably more than anything else cemented just my, um, uh, the joy of working with my hands and, and just, you know, making things was really cool. And I was always artistic. Um, so graduating high school, I said, well, I'll go to art school because it's something I'm pretty good at. So I went to art school and a lot of theory, a lot of talking, a lot of things that didn't really make sense to me. So I kind of floundered around and I found myself um, taking a basic crafts class, which was basically a woodworking class in the, in the furniture making department. And when I got introduced to that wood shop and I realized I could get college credits for cutting things up on a bandsaw, I was set. So I was uh, quickly found my way into the furniture making program. This was at uh, Long Beach State in Southern California. They had a tremendous um, crafts and furniture making program there. And that's where I really fell in love with woodworking. I think once that, that bug bites you, you know, once you sand down that, a piece of end grain and just feel how glass smooth that is, once you get an oil and wax finish on something, um, 
I don't think that ever leaves you. So I was uh, woodworking, working as a graphic designer um, for a skate shoe company in California, reading Fine Woodworking Magazine. Um, I, my son had just been born. He was three months old. I found an ad for a associate art director for this woodworking magazine in Connecticut. I said, asked my wife, hey, you want to move to Connecticut? She said, um, I guess so. Why? Said, well, you know, there's this job out there. And so um, she was, you know, gracious enough uh, to allow me to pick her up with her infant son and move her 3,000 miles across the country for um, really just kind of for a job I knew nothing about, but I love the magazine and I thought, how could this not be a great company to work for? And fortunately, it, it turned out to be perfect. I've been there for 19 years now. Mike's job at Fine Woodworking Magazine is to read manuscripts that are sent in, then figure them out and lay it all out. He uses photographs, illustrations, and captions to make it easier for readers to digest. When he is not hard at work at the Taunton Press, there is a good chance you might find him teaching a woodworking class. Being in the shop when everything goes right is the best place in the world to be. Being in the shop when everything is going wrong, it's a struggle. And when you see beginning woodworkers continually struggle at the same points in the game, whether it's sharpening, getting a hand tool up and running, um, cutting a joint, using, you know, even ripping a board on the table saw without it going all wonky and crooked. Um, there's so many aspects that uh, until someone says, no, do it this way, uh, it can be a real challenge. So I think in, for me in teaching, it's um, getting people over the hump to where they're just having a blast. One of the more important things for me is try to find time to be in the shop and make something that I really don't have a reason to make. You know, it's the, those personal Like projects. the Hobbit piece. Like my Hobbit cupboard. Uh, a woman came up when I was at a, a craft fair and she asked um, if I could make Hobbit furniture. And of course they said, yes, absolutely. I mean, because who wouldn't want to make Hobbit furniture? I had this panel laying around and he said, well, that looks like that would be a door for something that would be in a Hobbit house. And put this together. And it's, one, it's a little tiny piece. It's, it's almost a study of a piece, but you know how you're walking in the woods and you either see the acorn caps or the nuts themselves and they're often not ever together. So the finials, um, I just, I put together as two separate pieces with just a little rare earth magnet on the That's top. That's great. That is um, absolutely wonderful. So when people come by, you know, when they first touch it, a lot of times they'll do this and, and they'll, oh no. Um, but once they, they, they're aware of that surprise, the first thing they do when they come into the house, they just come into the house, hi, how you doing, how you doing? They'll come here, they'll do that, and they'll just keep walking. As we walked through Mike's house, he pointed out several other pieces he built, like this hay rake table you may recognize from the magazine. This stickly piece was also featured, and this curious piece that lives upstairs. Again, it's a case on stand. Uh, but in this case, it's a little drop front desk. Now that is just gorgeous. You know, rules of design are really, really good, but I think it's important to be able to break the rules when you want to. And like the strap hinges, is like, do strap hinges go with sort of a mid-century modern piece? Nope, don't really care. I just like strap hinges, so they're going to go on there. It's a Japanese element, it's called kumiko, and it's typically a grid work you see on shoji screens in Japanese architecture. To me, it's, it's just such a, a beautiful element, and just the way that it's made, all these pieces, you start with a background grid, and you bevel and cut these pieces to length and slip them in so that um, while it looks very delicate, all the pieces, because of their angles, you can put them all together, just dry fit, and it's a very solid, strong structure. So what I've got here is the finished Kumiko square. Um, this would be sort of a single unit of Kumiko created by um, filling out four adjacent squares to create a larger square. Um, it starts out with just a shiplapped grid. In this case, the square grid is very easy to make. It's just uh, half lap so the pieces come together. So I'm creating four squares. The next step is to add a diagonal to each of the four squares. So I have a little shooting board with a 45 degree end on it. And I've got my stop block set up to where I can insert my stock. 
This is basswood. Typically, um, it's a light colored wood. And I just use a sharp chisel. I've uh, tried using a block plane in the past. I have a little holder there just to hold that down. But I find a sharp chisel is just enough just to take that little edge off. And it leaves a really nice surface on there. And hopefully that stop block is in the right place. That should be able to fit right in there. And that's, it's a nice snug fit. And it's amazing how all the parts just stay in place without glue. Although in most instances, I do add a dab of glue to the corners just to hold them in place to keep them from possibly coming loose at a later date. How fun. And then once those triangles are created, it's three more pieces are used to create the pattern within each square. And if you have big old fat fingers like me, um, it takes a little doing. But it's amazing how, with the pieces angled just right, once the pieces are in place, they really lock everything in together. And this is the funnest part, is just pushing in that last little locking piece. And that's basically the pattern. And when all the squares are filled out, you create, actually this is a hemp leaf pattern. Um, it symbolizes good luck in Japan. Somebody says, Mike Pekovich, 10 years from now, uh, what would you like them to, to think? You know, if I, can, if I have something to communicate that can um, help someone along their journey, that's great. Um, I think, you know, it's maybe less for me uh, than my furniture in that I used to always think in terms of, oh, I want to make something that lasts 200 years. For some reason, 200 years, we always put that stamp on our furniture. It's a magic. This is built to last 200 years. And <clears throat> sort of a, a, a new thought to that is not so much making a piece of furniture that lasts a long time, but making a piece of furniture that has a long life. And those are, are sort of two different things. I kind of hope for my furniture I'm making today to be used, to be forgotten, to be rediscovered, and to sort of carry on on second and third lives down the road. And I think, um, you know, furniture built for the long haul, and I would like uh, one of my cabinets or boxes or, or tables to be sort of discovered at a flea market. No provenance, no gallery, no high price tag, no, no one explaining the wood and the grain and riffs on stock and through mortise and tenons, but just someone to say, oh, oh, that's nice. Yeah, come over here, honey. Look, yeah. at, look at this. Yeah. Or it goes in and people use it for bills or for the keys by the front door. And it's just, you know, and it's just this anonymous piece that um, sort of in a, in a really small way just you know in, increases the quality of life for the people who use it. I've got the Lee Nielsen honing guide in the shop and hopefully it will replace my Ole Clip style which was very very affordable but not machined to high tolerances. Lee Nielsen machined this specifically for use with their blades, their chisels, their hand plane irons. It is made of stainless steel with a wonderful bronze bearing here and it has some jaws. You remove these screws and there's a jaw on each side that comes off and th this is the standard set of jaws and you can use it to hone a chisel which I'm going to do in just a minute but you buy other sets of Lee Nielsen jaws for other applications. This will also do uh, most plain irons. So with a standard set, you're, you're getting a, a lot of productivity out of it. Let's see how it works on my chisel. I'm starting with a 4,000 grit diamond stone, and I'm working a secondary bevel on my chisel. Now I'm moving over to an 8,000 grit diamond stone, just continuing to polish out that secondary bevel. 
What I like about it is there's no extra movement. The, the bearing rolls so nicely and it's so substantial in your hand that there's no twisting or whatever that could take away from that great secondary bevel that you need to make a good cut. I'm turning the chisel over and getting rid of that little wire edge on the back. And finally, I'm taking it to my leather strop just to get a great edge. As you can see, it's plenty sharp. The Lee Nielsen Honing Guide is an asset to my shop. Improve your woodworking experience. Sign up for Wood News Online, a monthly newsletter showcasing the latest news, tips, and classes Highland Woodworking has to offer. By signing up, you'll receive the latest episode of the Highland Woodworker, special store promotions, and Wood News Online delivered straight to your inbox. Sign up today. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode. Follow us on our social media channels as well. And until next time, I'm Charles Brock, and I'm a Highland Woodworker.